it is difficult to imagine the days when church steeples were the tallest structures in Manhattan. Those days vanished with an American innovation called the skyscraper. The mightiest of these was the Empire State Building. Holding the record of the world's tallest skyscraper for nearly half a century, its unmistakable beauty and elegance helped to define the city in which it was built. New York is a city of symbols. The Statue of Liberty, Wall Street, Broadway. It's very tough to kind of become the symbol of New York City. I think it became a symbol of American capitalism, democracy, uh, a belief in the future. This was the building that everybody wanted to go to the top of. This is the building that everyone wanted to be seen at, photographed in front of, you name it. Everything about it was almost twice as big as the competing towers. 6,400 windows, 10 million brick. Twice as much structural steel as the Chrysler building. Over 200,000 cubic feet of Indiana limestone. 2.1 million square feet of floor space. Hundreds of thousands of rivets and buckets. It's a very big building. By the late 1800s, the tiny island of Manhattan had become one of the most powerful commercial centers in the world. Americans, awed by its wealth, dubbed New York the Empire State. Captains of industry thrived in Manhattan. But no matter how successful they became, one industry would make a fortune off of them all. Real estate. Just owning land did not make you rich, but owning an office building on it was a good start. By the turn of the century, however, the effort to build office buildings looked more like Dante's Inferno than a construction site. Conventional wisdom held that the taller the building could rise, the more money it would make. Unfortunately for developers, the technology of the time prevented these buildings from rising over a few hundred feet. An important advance in construction would change that. Up until the late 1880s, skyscrapers were built with massive masonry walls, the same basic building materials that the Romans had used. These walls supported the entire weight of the building. As buildings grew taller, walls grew thicker. Windows grew smaller and fewer as too many of them decreased the strength of the walls. Valuable rental space and precious sunlight were eaten up in the process. With the development of the steel frame, walls no longer supported the building's weight. Since their strength was no longer an issue, they could be built with lighter materials, even glass, allowing more light to enter the building. At long last, buildings could climb as high as their designers pleased. But the notion of the modern skyscraper would have been impossible had it not been for the innovations of one man. Various forms of elevators had already been in use for lifting cargo, but none were considered safe enough for transporting people. The great fear at the time, and even today, was what would happen if the cables lifting the elevator were suddenly to snap? Nothing was the answer Elijah Otis came up with. With the safety innovations he pioneered, developers felt confident enough to use elevators in their buildings. The Otis Elevator Company was eventually commissioned to build elevators for the Empire State Building, all 66 of them. With the ability to transport people to new heights, America entered the age of the skyscraper. The small building was in big trouble. There wasn't enough room to build in Manhattan without tearing something down. The 
It wasn't tall. Down it went. There were, however, a few stubborn exceptions. As buildings grew upwards, the competition between the men building them grew fierce as they struggled to make each skyscraper taller than the last. When the doors of the famous 22-story Flatiron Building opened in 1902, it was considered so overwhelmingly tall that New Yorkers placed bets as to how far the rubble would spill when it toppled over. But in 1913, the Woolworth Building would steal its spotlight. Glimpsing it for the first time, an awestruck New York minister called skyscrapers cathedrals of commerce. At 792 feet, it became the world's tallest building, the most prominent feature on Manhattan's skyline. But even at the height of the building boom, this skyline can be difficult to recognize without its most identifiable skyscraper. Two men, one a self-made millionaire, the other, a politician, were about to plan its construction. John Raskob was not a real estate man, but in 1929, when a two-acre plot of land smack in the center of Manhattan went on the market, he couldn't resist becoming one. Buying the land was one thing, but building on it would require an estimated $40 million, more money than Raskob could invest. He needed to find a partner, a man with enough star quality to lure other investors to the project. That man was Al Smith, the ex-governor of New York, who would have been president had he not lost to Herbert Hoover in the 1928 election. He was a guy who led the way toward America rethinking a lot of its racial, religious, and ethnic stereotypes when he ran for president and had to confront the fact that people wouldn't vote for him, hated him because he was a Catholic. And he carried it out with a sense of uh, dignity and grace and a tremendous sense of humor. I could see why the Empire State Building would appeal to him. It would be you know, the most dominating building, which is what he felt in New York City and New York State were, the most dominating presence in the country. He was such a, a, a well-known figure and such a beloved figure in, in New York City that um, he was the, the uh, titular president of the corporation and he made all of the guest appearances and he was part of the publicity machine that surrounded the production of this building. Jumping at Raskob's offer, Smith became a giant in the real estate business overnight. Together, the two men proudly announced their plans for the construction of not just any office building, but the tallest the world had ever seen, the Empire State Building. It would be built at 5th Avenue and 34th Street, a neighborhood Raskob predicted would become a great financial center. But there was one small problem. The location was the site of one of high society's greatest haunts, the world-renowned Waldorf Astoria Hotel. It was the largest hotel in the city. It was decorated in the very, very heavy, late Victorian style, this exuberant style that weighed a ton. By the 1920s, however, that over-heavy decoration of the late Victorian period had fallen out of favor. The 1920s were different. They were free and gay. The passage of Prohibition also threatened the hotel. The Waldorf Astoria was not about to break the law and become a speakeasy. People simply weren't going there anymore. There were newer hotels, more centrally located hotels, and there were restaurants galore where uh, with your steak you could have a nice glass of red wine. So they found themselves in a pickle. In October 1929, workers took a last look at the ornate halls of the Waldorf Astoria. Al Smith was moving in. The officers and directors of Empire State Incorporated are on the roof of the old Waldorf Astoria Hotel, about to begin demolition of that ancient and historic structure.
people from all over the world started writing to the management of the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, requesting very specific things, such as the key to a room that a couple had spent their wedding night in, or the doorknobs with WA embossed on them. So uh, there was this tremendous upsurge of interest in the hotel uh, when it started to come down. Uh, if, if there had been that same kind of interest in the 1920s on a regular basis, the hotel probably wouldn't have come down. In the end, more than 23,000 truckloads of debris were taken from the Waldorf Astoria. The construction of the giant that would replace the once great hotel could now begin. The daunting task of designing the world's largest building fell to the architectural firm of Shreve, Lamb and Harmon. Headed by William Lamb, the team's first task was to create a design for the Empire State Building that would be agreeable to the public, which had long since developed a fear of skyscrapers. Clearly there was a fear when tall buildings first went up that that light and air would be obliterated on the street. Especially from lower Manhattan, down where the taller and taller buildings were reaching toward the sky that filled up the whole block. And of course, the most famous of these was the Equitable Building, which was built in 1913 and seemed to completely obliterate the air. And you could go to that little street and only at high noon would any sunshine come down to it. So it was unhealthy to have a tall building. However much economic sense it may or may not have made, it did not make environmental or human or public health sense to build this. These concerns led New York to create a series of zoning laws in 1916 restricting the size and shape of skyscrapers. The zoning laws required that no building could rise straight up for more than 125 feet. To regulate this, an imaginary hypotenuse was drawn from across the street. Each time the hypotenuse hit a wall of the building, the designers were required to create a setback. This continued until the 30th floor. At that height, floor size of the entire building was limited to no more than one quarter of the land on which the building rested. From there, the building could rise to any height. The architects, Shreve, Lamb, and Harmon, were governed by these zoning laws. The zoning diagrams really helped to set the design. But there's a long way from a zoning diagram to a piece of architecture. So uh, I think the architects deserve great credit for within that zoning envelope creating a building that could have an inspirational and romantic image. The role of the architect is much broader than people realize. You can't just be the artiste, you have to also understand the budget and the schedule and how something is constructed and what it takes to make it happen. Architects are very much tied into value and bottom line. If you design a building for someone and he goes bankrupt, then you haven't done your job. Naturally, bankruptcy was a chief concern of John Raskob. In order for the Empire State Building to be a financial success, it would need to be ready for occupancy by May 1st. In the 1920s, that was the date in which all commercial leases were signed. If the building wasn't ready by May 1st, Raskob would be sitting on an empty skyscraper. This deadline required that the Empire State Building be completed in a mere 18 months. This included the time it took for the demolition of the hotel, the excavation for the basement, the immense task of erecting the steel frame, exterior masonry work, the installation of elevators, and the construction of the interior space. Foot by foot, no building had ever been constructed in such a short period of time. If they made the deadline, the construction of the Empire State Building would mark not only the world's tallest skyscraper, but also the world's fastest built. The race to build up began by digging down, 40 feet below street level. By the beginning of the spring of 1930, 
one of the first stages of construction was completed. The workers had prepared the concrete foundation from which the Empire State Building would rise. At this point, a tremendous amount of work on the building was still being performed behind the scenes. You might think this is an architectural blueprint for the Empire State Building, but it's not. It's an architectural blueprint for just one steel beam. The steel order for the Empire State Building was the largest that had ever been placed. The same amount of steel could have been used to construct 500 miles of railroad track. Since the steel beams in this case were going to be responsible for bearing the weight of the entire building, their construction had to be flawless. The fabrication process was exacting work. Blocks of steel were heated in giant furnaces called soaking pits to roughly 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The hot steel was then delivered through the mill on a series of carts and water-cooled rollers. At various stages, the steel was elongated and shaped into its desired form. then cut down to size and sent along to a finishing station. Rivet holes were drilled into the beams according to the designer's specifications. If a single rivet hole was a fraction of an inch off, the workers at the construction site would not be able to fit the beam into place, and countless hours of work would be lost. The steel was rolled and fabricated in Pittsburgh was put on rail cars and sent to a marshalling and staging area in Colstadt, New Jersey, and then put on a convoy of trucks. The steel which left Pittsburgh, which is some 450 miles, plus or minus as the crow flies, uh, from the job site, actually took approximately between 40 and 50 hours to get to the site, which meant that some of the larger plate sections were actually still hot to the touch from the fabrication that was done in the mill. Giant grillages made of steel and later filled with concrete helped to anchor the building to its foundation. The step cued the first beams to arrive at the site. They were lower support beams weighing up to 44 tons each and were attached to the grillages upon arrival. The workers would have to assemble roughly 10,000 tons of steel per month to make their deadline. The completed frame of the Empire State Building would require a massive 58,000 tons of steel. On April the 25th, after erecting the steel beams for one month, the workers completed the steel frame for the basement. They arrived at street level. Workers looking up could imagine an invisible ladder of floors yet unbuilt, where each floor reached would be a milestone. The workers built with incredible speed. So much steel was arriving at the site that each beam had to be numbered to indicate its proper place in the building. The delivery of materials was so finely honed that if a truck was 15 minutes late in arriving, they had to turn it back because it would have thrown the whole schedule out of kilter, out of whack. They would have to revise the schedule for the next day to accommodate the truck that had arrived late. Less than a month after reaching street level, the workers completed the sixth floor setback. This was the first major setback in the building required by the zoning laws. From here, 
the tower would rise with other major setbacks around the 30th floor, all the way to the proposed top of the building at the 86th floor. While the architects had designed the building on paper, the general contractors were overseeing its construction. Paul and William Starrett were two brothers who had come from a family of builders. There were five Starrett brothers. Four of them went into the construction business, sometimes in competition with each other. Uh, they didn't always agree with each other. In fact, there was great rivalry frequently among the brothers, but they were all very sensible, sober, hardworking men. Paul and William Starrett eventually went into business together. They pitched themselves to John Raskob and Al Smith as ideal men for the job. At the interview, they were asked that they have a whole bunch of equipment sitting in yards, waiting, mobilized, ready to go as their competitors um, uh, had done. This was done in Governor Smith's office. And the answer that Paul Starrett came back with is we don't have a blessed thing, not even a pick and shovel. Any piece of equipment that we'd have for this building would be useless. Everything we do here has got to be brand new. We're going to have to invent new technology and construction. The decision to hire the Starrett brothers would not be regretted. They were efficient managers of the operation. They had to move both men and materials um, to those great heights with a tremendous amount of organization. In fact, one of the Starrett brothers, William Starrett, wrote that building skyscrapers is the nearest peacetime equivalent of war. Um, and it really was an army of workers that they